Hi, good evening all. Um, welcome to the TBHG uh, first set of presentations. Um, we have uh, Warwick Lister K, um, and Warwick is um, probably one of the most prestigious Scottish flyers at the moment. Um, he has had four XC uh, concurrent year wins. Um, he was the Scottish paragliding uh, chairman and uh, was voted number 23 as the most eligible bachelor in Scotland at one stage. So um, what I would like to do is um, just give a, a very quick uh, overview of what we're doing here. Um, we're working our way around uh, the country, um, getting um, very prestigious uh, speakers uh, in their field, experts in their field, um, to present uh, taking the Thames Valley members uh, outside of our comfort areas. And uh, we're starting in Scotland, trying to get some people from Wales, trying to get some people from the ex, uh, ex Alps and New Zealand, my uh, sort of adopted hometowns. And, uh, and just whilst lockdown is sort of doing people's head in, um, is just to make this available to everybody and to uh, try and invite us to uh, explore uh, different flying venues around the UK once once uh, lockdown has been lifted. So without further ado, um, I shall hand over to Warwick um, to proceed and I'll just do the, the administration. If I can ask, um, by all means, feel free to message into the chat room um, any questions, um, but let's uh, leave Warwick to uh, just have a smooth run of pre doing his presentation and at the end we'll have some Q&A. And with that, uh, over to yourself Warwick, thank you. Um, thank you very much Jock, that's um, a massively overblown introduction, um, some of it was true. <laughs> um, no, it's really great to be here and it's, uh, thank you for those of you who have uh, taken the time to log in. I, I'm hoping that the sound of my uh, one-year-old son uh, being lulled to sleep in the background isn't too disturbing for you. Um, when Jock asked me to do this presentation, um, I was initially quite flattered and I agreed to do it. And um, not long afterwards, he told me that he, in the same series, he had invited uh, Greg Hamilton and uh, Gavin McClurg and Nick Maynans to talk. And um, ever since he told me that, I've had a crushing sense of imposter syndrome and I've um, barely had a, a night's sleep. Um, I think I should make it absolutely clear from the outset that I'm, uh, I'm simply a, an intermediate pilot. Uh, um, I've been playing for six or seven years and um, I'm certainly not in the same league as, as any of those gentlemen mentioned. Um, I guess what, what does make me a bit different and um, hopefully uh, you know, bring something special to the table is, is the place in which I live. So this is me uh, in my backyard. Uh, I'm very, very fortunate to live in a magnificent part of the Highlands and um, on an amazing bluebird day like this one, um, at 5,000 feet over um, remote Highland peaks. There's absolutely nowhere um, better in the world, in my opinion. Um, this flight was, a, uh, this video footage was taken just a few minutes after I'd launched from a, a launch that's 20 minutes from my house. Um, and, you know, on a day like this, I can see to the West Coast, I can see Coolin of Sky, I can see south to Ben Nevis, I can see the east coast, um, so see both coasts of, of Scotland, um, and it's just absolutely beautiful, as you can see. And I'm passionate about the Highlands generally, um, but I'm, also, I'm particularly passionate about, about paragliding up here. Before I get into the presentation, I just want to mention the show notes, um, which Jock will release on the chat uh, of the of, of the chat side of the Zoom page, hopefully right now. Um, the show notes have got 
quite extensive um, references about things that I'm talking about. But there's a few things that I'd like to draw to your attention in particular. And this is the only bit of gratuitous self-promotion that I will do. So just bear with me for a few minutes. Um, so first of all, um, Kieran Campbell and I are putting together um, a guided uh, cross-country flying trip for a small group of pilots in the spring of 2022. The aim of it is to put together a trip which will uh, maximize the flying opportunities in the week, but will also offer just a really great holiday for non-pilots. So the idea, the target market that we're going for is pilots and their non-flying partners. So we've put together a really great itinerary. If the flying is on, the pilots will go off and fly while their partners have a great day. And if the flying is not on, then the pilots will just join their partners in whatever activity it is they're doing that day. So we've called it a Highland Fling. There's a, um, a link to it in the show notes. Please do have a look if that sounds appealing to you. Secondly, um, myself and, and Ben Johnson are resurrecting the ex Scotia Hike and Fly Comp. The dates are set for the 5th and 6th of June this year. Um, and this will be Scotland's reply to the X Lakes. Um, if you're a hike and fly fiend. And finally, I want to pay special tribute and give thanks to Kieran Campbell. Um, you're going to see quite a few of his incredible photographs, just like this one of, uh, of him flying into Glencoe uh, throughout this presentation. He's undoubtedly Scotland's premier paragliding photographer um, with work that you'll have seen regularly in Cross Country Magazine and other places. Um, so thank you, Kieran, and, and watch out for his, his photographs. His um, website and social media links are in the show notes. I am assuming that in the COVID world, lots of UK pilots will be thinking that they may not be able to travel abroad this year and they might be looking for flying opportunities closer to home. And I imagine that a number of you will be casting your thoughts and your eyes northwards and, and contemplating um, some flying in Scotland. So the aim of this presentation is really to provide you with some inspiration um, along those, those lines. And um, also the information or some information at least that will be helpful in allowing you to achieve. So let's just quickly break the highlands down. Um, this red line is the sort of traditional boundary between the lowlands and the highlands. It's called the Highland Boundary Fault Line. It is a physical line um, where literally there is a fault line and, and to the north of it is mountainous and wild and beautiful. Um, to the south of it, there are cities and politicians. Um, a slightly more notional line is this one to the east of the Cairngorms. To the east of it is Aberdeenshire, which is really flat land. It's not really considered part of the Highlands. Um, also fishermen, oilmen, and um, some fairly peculiar accents. And um, I've deliberately cut the north of Scotland, the, the very north off, because again, it's pretty flat. It's very boggy. It's difficult to fly. And um, very, very odd sexual practices up there. So <laughs> what we're concerned about with this presentation is, is the Highlands. Um, I, I, many of you will know this, but I think a lot of people in the UK don't actually appreciate you know, exactly really how remote and wild the Highlands are. This is an area of 20,000 square miles with a population of a quarter of a million people living in it. Um, our capital city, we use the term uh, advisedly, is, has 70,000 people. That makes it smaller than Bracknell. Um, and our population density is about 12 people per square kilometre. And most of them live in the towns. So the rural areas are extremely lightly populated, um, have relatively few roads. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it's... I don't like the term wilderness because it's not wilderness anymore, but it's certainly wild land um, and it's magnificent. Um, I'm going to just break the Highlands down a little bit because maybe into sort of bite sized chunks to make it a little bit more accessible. First of all, let's just look at the Cairngorms. This is our biggest national park. 
Um, the yellow star is the Glen Shee uh, Ski Centre. It's one of the three places in the Highlands where you can get a lift to launch. So there's a, um, a chairlift there. The Cairngorms is somewhat daunting. It's a massive um, plateau. Um, so if I go to this, uh, sorry, just bear with me. I'm unable to advance the slide now. Oh, there we go. If I go to this uh, photograph by Kieran, you can see what I mean about it being a plateau. There are these sort of very um, high altitude, relatively flat areas, mega boonies, um, and then split up or fissured by these deep glacial valleys, very steep sided valleys within it. Very few roads, um, a lot of um, high altitude uh, wildland, quite intimidating to cross, um, but because it's a big circle, the National Park, it offers great flying right around its periphery on um, just about any um, on just about any um, wind direction. And there are one or two roads uh, in it, which um, will um, you know, allow you to access the center of it too. Um, so that's the Cairngorms. The next region I want to mention is uh, the Nevis Range, Glencoe and the Trossachs. So there are two stars there. The northern one is Nevis Range or Anachmore as we call it. There's a big cable car there. And the lower one is the Glencoe Ski Centre um, chairlift. So again, the other two places where you can get a lift to launch in the Highlands. Um, Nevis Range, obviously Ben Nevis is our highest mountain. It's a north facing uh, launch and um, you can get a cable car right well, halfway up the mountain, so right to launch. So it's a great place to, to, to uh, launch yourself cross country down towards um, Glencoe. Glencoe is obviously one of the iconic sites of British paragliding as well as just iconic um, destinations in the Highlands. Mm -hmm. And you know the home of the famous Buchal Et of Moor, this massive lump that sits at the, the head of Glen Nevis, sorry, um, Glencoe to the right and Glen Et of to the left. Um, this mountain is just one thermal away from launch. So if you get high from launch, you can cross to this and be thermaling above it with spectacular views in every direction. Um, it's quite looking terrain but as you can see the valley especially Glencoe at that point it's quite broad and it opens out onto Rannoch Moor so there's actually a large sort of relatively open flatland flying area straight off launch um, which can be accessed there it's just a, a fantastic place on the right day um, and the Trossachs is a national park down in the sort of southeast of that red there um, there is a concentration of very well used sites there, mostly because it's so close to the central belt in Glasgow and Edinburgh that a lot of pilots will, you know, will shoot up there and it's relatively accessible for them. So it gets used a lot. Um, and again, there's just lots of beautiful flying in that area. Now this area I've called the Six Glens. Um, nobody else calls it that. That's just a name that I came up with. But this is the, really the, the, my backyard. Um, the six glens are Glen Clooney, Glen Affric, Glen Cannon, Strathfara, uh, Glen Oren, and Strathconnan. It's basically an, an area of valleys running crudely from west to east with high hills um, either side of them. Um, it offers really great flying, very remote, very few roads, lots of boonies. Um, but um, really great opportunities, particularly to try and fly across, you know, coast to coast. So from, from east to west coast, for example. Back on. So Torridon, the west coast and Sky, um, you know, the west coast is famously beautiful part of the highlands. Um, high, rocky, steep sided mountains with deep um, uh, sea locks, effectively fjords pushing inland, just creates this beautiful coastland, coastline with spectacular views. And there's some really great flying in that area. Um, so for example, on the Isle of Skye, you've got the, um, the Coolin, 
Um, this is my favorite photograph of me, again, taken by Kieran um, with the, the black coolant in the background. Um, and um, there's also, I mean, I would say the West Coast in particular is really great for sort of hike and fly. There's, um, there's really, you know, great opportunities for walking up mountains and just flying off them. Um, and then I just want to mention the Mauna Lea quickly. This is a relatively little known sort of uh, range. And it's just worth a mention because of, of Craig Meggie, which is a mountain in the south uh, west end of that kind of oval. And it's a great launch from which to then to fly up the Spey Valley um, towards Abbeymoor. And you, you're within glide of a road the whole way. Um, but there's really good cross countries to be done there. Um, and I mean, for example, two years ago, Tony Shepherd flew 100k out and returned from Craig Maggie just up well beyond Abbey Moor and then turned around, came back down again, landed back at launch. Um, he was cruising at seven and a half thousand feet most of the way and uh, rang me on the, home way, on the way home to, to tell me all about it when I was stuck at work. <laughs> so I'll never forget it because I was sick as a pig. So it's just worth uh, we mentioned. There's a few other sites within the Monolia as well. Um, I've put on uh, Tim Bridle's record breaking 170k flight from the south up towards Nairn. That's the longest flight within the Scottish borders to date. Um, so that just gives you a sense of scale. That's about 170k cross country there. Um, of course, there are dozens of other sites um, within the Highlands, uh, many of them out with those areas that I've mentioned. And I just want to quickly mention this resource. This is an ebook called Scottish Paragliding by Cliff Smith with photographs by Gary Williamson. Um, the link is in the show notes. It's really, it's a really, really good site guide to the Highlands and Scotland generally, um, and um, is 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 definitely worth a look. Um, as you can see, you can also print it off and ring bind it if you're super keen. Um, another good resource would be just to look at past years on the SHPF XC League. Um, so just a great place to go and see where people have done long flights from on what dates and where from and you can analyze them in more depth if you want to. Um, of course, use this some term site rather differently up here than you do down in England. We have practically no managed sites. We have you know, basically no sort of managed sites that are managed by clubs. I can think of one in Scotland. Um, typically, our sites are just spots on a hillside which have historically worked under certain conditions. And, um, you know, there are many, many, many potential sites that we sort of know of and use regularly. Um, but also one of the fun things about flying in the Highlands is just to try and find new sites, check out new places, you know, look at a map and think, well, that might work and go and see. Um, and one of the reasons that we have the opportunity to go and do that is because of our amazing access laws some of you may recognize the broad grin there of Dr. Matt Wilkes. I know that uh, you guys helped him with his reserve um, research, which is also linked in the show notes um, through the Big Fat Repack. Um, so the access laws in Scotland, as we is rather nicknamed as the right to roam, basically can be summarized that you, you can take non-vehicular access more or less anywhere obviously people's gardens and sort of military areas and prisons and things are excluded but you can take a bicycle a canoe walk on foot fly a paraglider anywhere um, in rural scotland providing you're not disrupting people's legitimate activities and businesses so there's uh, and this is all um written in the Scottish Outdoor Access Code, which is again linked in the show notes. Um, the, emphasis on, is a, is, the emphasis is on responsible access. So it is a two-way street. Yeah, we have this amazing privilege, but we have to be careful that we're not, um, as I say, disrupting people's businesses, causing damage, um, following the countryside code, all of that good stuff. And there are a few tripwires. There are ways in which you know you could get it wrong. So local sensitivities include, for example, um, special access arrangements. Some clubs have arrangements with estates whereby they can drive four by fours up hill tracks onto launches, providing that the um, gamekeeper is informed and that you know flying doesn't take place at certain times of year, etc. 
Um, and there are other places where the gamekeepers or the landowners like to be informed of what's going on and, and the clubs respect that. Um, lambing and shooting, in the springtime we have to be really careful about lambing fields. Um, that is a surefire way to piss off the locals is to la land in amongst um, pregnant ewes. Um, and shooting from August, mid-August onwards is something we need to be careful not to disrupt. Breeding birds, um, in the area that I fly in a lot, there's a, several golden eagle nests. We liaise with the lo local raptor study groups to make sure that we're not disrupting um, schedule at one breeding birds. Um, and that's really important. Um, and also latterly, sort of COVID related stresses, you know, people who might have been totally chilled about access before now worry about, you know, numbers of people on their land and high touch areas and, and things like that. So I think what, really what I'm driving at here is that um, if you are gonna come after and fly in the Highlands, please do contact the local clubs and pilots. And I've put um, links to not only all the websites and Facebook pages, but also all the telegram groups in the show notes. Um, it's a very, very friendly community up in Scotland. You know, we will extend the hand of friendship to anyone who wants to come and fly up in the Highlands. Um, and not only will contacting local pilots mean that you can avoid, you know, the kind of trip wires that I mentioned, but also the locals are gonna show you where's the best place to go and fly on any given day. So it'll be to your advantage as well. <clears throat> Speaking of roaming, um, if you come to fly in Scotland, you will be walking. Um, as I mentioned, there's only three places that you can get a lift to launch. So everywhere else you go, you're gonna to need to walk to launch. And sometimes it can be quite a walk, as you can see my good buddy, Neil Rollings here, uh, making his way up a pretty steep, rocky um, slope in order to try and fly off this mountain. As you can see from the sea, it was quite a windy day and um, in the end, we, had, we walked most of the way back down again and flew the last couple of hundred metres back to the car, but it was a beautiful day's walking. Uh, it might be more sort of benign, heathery slopes like that, and it might be snowy slopes, um, but you're almost always going to have a great view when you get to the top. Um, and generally speaking, we find quite nice places to lay out as well, um, especially as you get into the higher terrain, the heather gives way to uh, some grassy slopes and kind of mossy areas like this and you can have really really like lovely areas to lay out. Um, it can also be heathery and rocky and uh, one tip I would give you is to, is to if you're in the, amongst the heather or the rocks to bring your wing up really gingerly sort of perfect that technique of just lifting it up to make sure it's not snagging a bit before you then raise it above your head. Um, I've pinged a few lines on launch before I got a bit more canny about, about looking after the wing as I was launching it. So here's a lovely launch um, on Murusk uh, with Glen Torridon in the background. You can see the quartzite slopes of Ben A and Leagach in the, in the background there. And then the other place you're going to end up walking if you want to fly cross country is when you bomb out. And uh, that little video clip that I showed you of me on the, the blue sky day at the very beginning I flew to the west coast, but I uh, hit the sea breeze and landed about 15k short of a public road uh, in this beautiful glen that I'd never been to before. And there was a track in it, as you can see, but it was also 30 degrees and I ended up walking for three hours to get to the road. So if you do come up, you know, be prepared for the boonies. I would say that an in-reach or a spot is absolutely essential, um, generally, uh, but um, especially up in the Highlands. Um, we, there is more and more mobile phone reception up here, but in these kind of constricted uh, remote glens, there's still zero mobile phone reception. So for the sake of yourself and your loved ones and the people you're flying with, and, and also for the mountain rescue teams in the event of an accident, please do bring a spot or an in-reach. Mapping software, you know, view ranger or, or equivalent is important and good boots and poles. You know, you're not gonna be walking or you're not going to want to walk to launch, let alone out from a, a remote landing in, in, in trainers, for example. Um, the good news is that Highland stream water is all drinkable, and in my opinion, the best water in the world. So pretty much any upland water you can drink um, straight from the stream. Uh, but of course, the beer is even better. And uh, having walked three hours on that day, I managed a quick pint in the, the Dorney pub 
before getting the bus back to drum the rocket. Um, the other consideration in the boonies or, and on launch is the Highland Midge, um, Culicoides impunctatus is its um, Latin name, which literally translates as little biting bastard. And they are a pain in the ass. Um, they're not dangerous, but they're just a real irritation. Um, I recommend these midge nets. They're lighter than carrying um, a liquid repellent and dead easy just to whip out your pocket and stick on when you land. Um, and also um, some of the liquid repellents contain DEET, which will corrode your gear. It eats plastic. So um, it's definitely not good to have on your hands. I've also had the problem with putting uh, repellent on my face and then sweating and finding that I'm blind midair. Um, one, I've had that once before. It was an extremely unpleasant experience. So yeah, the midge nets are a really good investment. They cost about two quid. Um, the midges are pro problematic from the end of May through until the autumn and the first frosts. But actually, ticks are a bigger concern now, especially with the, the spread of Lyme disease. Um, you need to be careful to protect yourself from ticks. And um, if you do get bitten by a tick, you need to watch out for the symptoms of Lyme. So what about the, uh, the best time of year to fly? I've put up a few snowy pictures already and you guys are probably thinking this is like something like north of the wall in Game of Thrones up here in the Highlands. And yeah, in the middle of winter, it can be pretty snowy, especially up in the mountains, like here in the Cairngorms on the 15th of February. But if you look at this little video clip filmed on the 10th of February, the previous year, you can see that we were launching at two and a half thousand feet in a, just a, a dusting of snow and that there was no snow anywhere else. So increasingly, you know, climate change and all of that, um, there is less snow in the winters. Uh, let me just admit, Marcin. Uh, can't I press? But for me, spring is king. And I mean, you won't be surprised to hear me say that. The conditions in spring can be absolutely incredible, beautiful, clear days, very high base, good muscular clouds, um, and really fantastic cross-country potential. It's also just a wonderful time to be in the Highlands. In April and May, we do seem to get these sort of prolonged spells of flyable weather. Um, and um, it, so it can be really beautiful, even if it's not flyable, but you can actually, if you're lucky, get three or four days of flyable weather consecutively. Um, it's also pre-mage, which is a bonus. But of course, any conversation about spring has to come with the, um, you know, the typical spring health warning. Yeah, the, the thermals can be very strong. They can be very sharp edged. And of course, we, we all lack currency. So, you know, you need to self-assess, assess the day and just set your goals appropriately. Um, and obviously try and avoid accidents. Um, I remember this is a photograph that Kieran took of, I think that's Khaled NASA heading out towards Glen Torridon. I, I think I may be in that photograph as well somewhere, but I think I'm just one pixel. But Kieran said to me afterwards that um, he had to take his hands off the camera um, when he got spat out the side of a cloud with his wing folded in half. Um, so, and we also got snowed on like in that day. Um, so, it was an epic day. Kieran and I both flew, I think, 70 or 80k, and Jules, Jules Robinson flew 100k triangle that day. Um, but it was rough. It was it was strong at times, you know, on, on the edges of the thermals in particular. Um, the early summer can be beautiful. Um, June and July, the flyable days days are very good, although they tend to be a little bit more interspersed. Um, generally more mellow conditions, although you can still get strong days in, uh, in June. And of course, lots of midges around at that time of year. But it's a nice time to be in the Highlands as well. It's just a, it's a very nice time of year. Long days, of course. So we have um, you know, 20, 20 hours of daylight um, in, right in the middle of the summer. Um, August, in my opinion, is a shit month. I don't like August at all. Um, the Highlands are rammed with tourists. Uh, it's the school holidays. The weather's generally rubbish. Um, it's midge as hell. Um, I'm a wildlife 
guide uh, run a sort of wildlife tourism business all the wildlife goes into hiding in august so it's not very good time to do that either so i don't like august that's all i'm going to say about august um the autumn can be magnificent it's a beautiful time to be in the highlands generally lovely light amazing you know um, changing colors and changing time of year all the rest of it but it also can uh, offer up some surprisingly good flying um this is the coolin uh on the 16th of august uh, sorry 16th of october this year kieran and i went up for a couple of days took our tents up and, and just camped up on the beach up there um we launched from just the previous slide just from where i took that photograph and then we just boated about locally to the hill for an hour or so flew with white-tailed eagles and kieran had flown with golden eagles earlier in the day and then we top landed here on the top of this hill just for shits and giggles and had a bite to eat and a pee and then we launched it was about three o'clock in the afternoon by this point um 16th of october and hit a three up climb to base so I said, thanks very much, we'll have that. And we went off on a sort of little out and return, tiny little out and return in the local area for going home. So it was a really magnificent day flying very, very late in the season. Um, and we do also fly in the winter, um, not thermic, of course, but, and the thing that we really like to do, I mean, uh, me and a few others, uh, is what we call the dawn raids. So get up early in the morning, head torch, walk up the hill in the dark, and then launch at dawn. And you can get these absolutely incredible sunrises, winter sunrises. And that's my good flying buddy, Neil Rawlings there. Um, and uh, yeah, we've done a quite a few of these over the last few years, and it, they're almost always rewarding. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a couple of little videos of, of these. They have sound, I have a horrible feeling you're not going to hear the sound, but hopefully you'll you'll do without. So the first one was 21st of February a couple of years ago. This was with a friend of mine, Tony Gotch, and uh, also Adrian Howe and I think Sebastian Ryder. It might have been Roland Ryder's brother. And we walked up, yeah, watched the dawn on, this is uh, Ben A, and then just had some absolutely beautiful... <laughs> And the second video is this is from Sylvan. Uh, second job. Yeah, perfect. To, yeah, perfect. Know, Absolutely lovely. Thank you very much, Warwick. So this is from Sylvan. This was um, 2nd of January. So a um, friend of mine, Phil, and I had uh, canoed in to Sylvan on the 1st of January, slightly hung over after partying for the new year, and then camped. Um, so we canoed in in the dark, five or six kilometres along Loch Viati, which is the one you can see just underneath the sun there. Camped and then got up pre-dawn and walked up Sylvan in order to try and fly off the summit at, uh, at dawn. So it's just a short video on that. Look at us in the Biala. We're doing it, Warwick, we're doing it. Yeah, we're doing it. Okay. beautiful time of day, pre-dawn, gloaming, half 
light. Just light coming into the sky and distant hills to the right. just landed down by the river. So these um, winter fly downs are really special. I actually love them. Of course, um, extremely difficult to plan for in terms of sort of visiting pilots. You know, typically the weather in the Highlands in the winter is fairly rubbish, but then we just get these occasional beautiful days with light wind. So speaking of weather, uh, what about the weather? I'm not a meteorologist and I, I you know, I, I'm not going to even pretend to go into great detail here. I also think that um, the sort of the flow of the way I look at analysing the weather is probably extremely similar to the way you guys do it down south. Um, I mean, typically I'll just look at cross country where actually weather, you know, for the week ahead or lazy rasp or one of those things. Um, this photograph was taken during lockdown, of course. Um, last year when we had loads of good flying weather and we couldn't fly. Um, then I look at RASP and then windy, especially wind at altitude, and that's important here, more so than down south, I would imagine. Um, trying to learn my skew tees. And then, so having, you know, given that all due consideration and uh, careful thought, I then um, follow the sky gods. Um, so again, all the more reason to be on Telegram and find out where the guys who really know what they're talking about are going. Um, I remember Tony Shepard uh, saying to me once that flying in the Highlands is a bit like flatland flying with hills below you. And I think what he meant by that is that we don't really have valley winds to speak of, not in the same way that you do in the Alps, for example. Um, I mean, we will get a sea breeze coming in, you know, towards the end of a a beautiful warm day and you know depending on the topography that will kind of slop inland a bit but it it's not going to bother you much other than um, killing the thermals as you approach the coast and it can also set up convergence of course so um, can work to your advantage. Um, we do have to, to be concerned about overdevelopment but I would say that the main consideration when flying in the islands is the met wind and met, related, met wind related hazards. So I personally am fairly wind intolerant. I don't like, you know, I don't tend to even walk up onto launch if the wind's forecast at more than about 12k an hour on launch. And I guess that downsides you're flying in a lot more than that fairly regularly. Um, you know, uh, compression on the high peaks can be pretty um, significant and of course rotor 
behind the terrain is something we have to be really careful about. And also the way in which the Met wind can be kind of channeled into complex topography when you've got you know, a system of, of corries within you know, a high plateau, for example, you might be flying, gliding down towards it and thinking, yeah, I'm not really sure how the wind's gonna react to being rammed into that terrain. So I'm not gonna go in there. So these are the sort of concerns about flying in the highlands, I would say. And of course, with, you know, you're starting higher. I mean, often we're launching at two and a half to 3000 feet. So it doesn't matter if there's not much wind in the valley floor, it can, even by the time you get to launch, it can be quite windy. So the wind gradient is, a, you know, is, is a concern. I, I definitely recommend listening to Tony Shepard's talk on Scottish cross-country flying. It's on my YouTube channel. Um, it was a presentation he gave a couple of years ago and he goes into great uh, detailed analysis of how he looks at his weather um, consideration before flying, as well as a whole lot of other really useful and interesting information. It's very badly filmed by me, um, but the content within it is, is really worthwhile. It's about an hour long, so I, I recommend that to you. It's in the show notes, there's a link to it in the show notes. Of course, you can do all the weather um, analysis that you, you like, and ultimately you can get up and to launch and it's, and it's not flyable. So uh, that, I have to say that doesn't happen very often. Um, I can probably count the number of times I've walked back down the hill on the fingers of two hands actually in the last five years, um, but it can happen. And I think my best advice to you, you know, with regards to the weather and, and with regards to coming up to the Highlands to try and fly is to come prepared to do other things. If you put aside a week and you come up here and you're just determined to go paragliding, you're setting yourself up for disappointment because you might not get a single flyable day in that week. But if you come up with the mindset that the Highlands is an amazing place to visit, beautiful, with so many opportunities to do other interesting things, and I'll bring my paraglider and if it's flyable, I'll, I'll get in touch with the locals and you know, go and join them, then you know, you've got a good chance of having a great time. So, you know, even on our not flyable days, the hill walking can be, you know, unbelievably good, for example. Um, the wild swimming, take advantage of our right to roam, go and swim in Loch Ness or, you know, any one of the thousands of lochs and rivers in the Highlands. Um, go canoeing. This is my wife and my now sadly departed little dog on the canoe on the river just in front of our house. Um, fishing. Um, and when my paragliding helmet's not being used for flying, then you know, occasionally I use it on a motorbike. I, I told my daughter that she should wear a helmet too, and she called me a snowflake. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my advice with regards to the weather. It, it is fickle. Flying days are relatively few and far between, but when you're not flying, there's amazing other things to be doing up here. So don't sit about being frustrated about the weather. Just think about you know other cool things to do and if it comes good you could find yourself wingtip to wingtip with a golden eagle like Greg Callum did a couple of years ago and um, actually happens fairly regularly up here and it's not just the eagles that are here to help you find the thermals the locals are friendly as I've said before and I want to emphasize this point please do get in touch um, you know there's a really friendly scene up here we will do everything we can to help you get the best of your, your flying opportunity. And, you know, um, yeah, that's what I'm gonna say about that. So thank you for your attention. That's about all I have to say. I'll leave you with a little bit of footage from really my only good cross country flight in 2020, had a nice 50K and I flew across this remote little range of hills called the Fanex. Um, which I'd never seen before. They're very hard to get to by foot. And it was just a magnificent day. And guess what? It was in August. So I guess August's not all bad. So that's the end of my presentation and I'll be happy to take any questions. Jock, are you there? Of course.
we can we can start the this is just background now we can start talking okay um one of the uh comments you made uh, was about getting in touch with the locals um is there any sort of telegram groups that people can uh join um is there any sort of main main groups that people can come and go or seek yeah. advice from they're all, all on the show notes okay thank you um some questions came through about weather um and okay um there's some questions coming through at the moment uh okay i'm so, going to stop sharing now maybe i can yeah. look at the chat group so some of the some of the questions are um what kind of gear would you would you take for hike and fly um and um before you answer that um what kind of uh information would be in the guidebooks um does it cover routes and such like as well for the uninitiated which guidebooks do you mean the the one that you showed in the presentation does it show you, uh, it's, it's, you... It's, most, it's mostly a site guide and uh, it's got um it, it's just got pages and pages and pages of information about sites how to get to them which wind directions they take um any sort of special things that you need to be you know it's got little site briefings um it's a really really good resource i, I recommend it I mean, there's also paragliding earth, but I mean, it really just doesn't just doesn't touch the sides of the of the, the options. But I mean, again, I just can't reiterate enough. Just get on the Telegram groups and find out where um, the locals are going, and then you know they'll help you. Uh, you know, I, I've never seen a visiting pilot get anything other than you know a warm welcome and lots of information on the Telegram groups. So okay. that would be the. Uh, get the site guide by all means, but but ask the locals. I mean, you know, I think that's the same anywhere in the world, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, some interesting questions about um, where would you and how would you attach your ice axe um, if you were winter flying? Yeah, that's a very good, that is a very good question. It's one I gave a lot of thought to ice axe and, um, and the um, crampons. I mean, the prospect of flying with a, with a bag full of knives on my back um really didn't appeal so what i actually did and i've only done it i've only re done real sort of proper winter mountaineering and flown off a couple of times and um, people like mark robson and bren reed and stuff used to do a lot of that but um what i did in the end was i i took a little bag like a little sort of canvas shoe bag up and i put them in that um i would only had a tiny little sort of fold up ice axe um, put them in that and then clip them onto my front uh, for launch. And then as I was coming into land, I'd unclip them and drop them on the ground. Very sage. Um, some comments coming in about Sylvan and um, were you aware that you could launch from it before you actually set off to climb it? Uh, yes, I was. I'd been up before. I'd walked up it years ago and I'd also flown off it once before. It's actually got... For a, for a hill that looks like a sort of shark fin, it's got incredibly, you know, 2,000 foot cliffs either side of it. Um, it's got a billiard table top. It's got a launch, I mean, the size of um, a school football ground. It's amazing. Okay. Um, I think some of the, some of the comments surrounded about um, um, is clouds a problem? But I think you covered that in your, your meteor. Um, what's the best time of year? I think you've covered that um, from various aspects. Um, I think um, from, uh, well, you, you obviously won't know this, but uh, when one of the times that you dropped out, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I informed, I was padding a little bit, but uh, it was just to let people know that it's about a six hour drive from say Oxford to Glasgow, and then from Glasgow to Fort William, it's two hours. And then um, that would be give or take, you know, maybe half an hour for, for picnic stops and stuff like that. But um, I would be right uh, in saying that from say Glencoe with that lovely pointy mountain, um, I think you called it the Buchel, uh, Bucolet of Moor, um, that lovely pointed mountain towards Cairngorms would be about two hours 
um, drive, would that be about right? An hour and a half, two hours? Uh, yeah, two hours, yeah. Okay, so uh, roughly speaking for people, um, if they were trying to um, coordinate uh, like a day's flying, if they, they wanted to shift around, they can they could probably be quite mobile around that that sort of um, where you had your stars on your map. How how quickly could you get from one to the other? Yeah, I mean, I mean, absolutely. If you if you wanted to sort of position yourself, I mean, well, obviously, as the as a flying day approaches, you're going to sort of get a feel for which side of the country is going to be better. So you could start moving in that direction, you know, 48 hours in advance. But let's say you, you know, you were coming up and parking overnight with one day to fly. And you, you know, if you parked yourself near Newton Moore or King UC, mm -hmm. you could be at just about any flying site in the country within two and a half hours the next morning. So Newton Moor King, you see that's round about Loch Ness, this sort of the bottom of Loch no, it's, Ness it's, between, it's between a, Loch Ness. It's on the A9, yeah. So on the A9, so as you're coming up the main trunk road up to towards Inverness, um, at yep. the sort of western end of the western edge of the Cairngorms. But then there's a road, there's a road that takes you off down towards Fort William there as well, and there's also roads that take you off towards Aberdeenshire. So it's sort of like a central point from which. There are roads going in every direction you'd want to go in, if that makes sense. Yep. An excellent question from Mr. Pintreath. Um, can you tell us more about uh, the big NOTAM airspace area in your six Glen areas? And yeah. So the, the Highland, um, I can't remember what it's called now, but the Highland military uh, airspace, um, so long ago since I've even thought about it, that I can't even remember what it's called. But anyway, it's been switched off. So, I mean, apart from around the airports um, and as of last year around the royal residences, there's basically no airspace in the Highlands. Okay. Um, so yeah. We and again, occasionally, occasionally we get military exercises up here um, and then we tend to no time things more sort of assiduously then. But I mean, again, it's one of the sort of beauties of flying in the highlands is that we generally don't have to worry about airspace and um i oh god i hope i don't get in trouble for saying this but we don't generally know time stuff because but my experience is by the time you've no time stuff um it's you know it's too late or the time the no time kicks in you've already launched and probably left where you we're going to no time anyway okay highly um, restricted area thank you gary um Probably lastly, um, is for for me to thank you. Um, it's just it's just gone over the hour. Um, so um, one of the things I would like. Sorry, before you finish, I just want to mention one thing that's just popped into my mind. Uh -huh. Sort of COVID-related concerns. Right. Um, so COVID has changed things a little bit, um, and I just want to make people aware of that. First of all. I anticipate, as I think most people do, that the Highlands will be absolutely rammed this summer. Um, it was rammed, it's been rammed the last few summers anyway, it was particularly rammed last summer, and it will be more so this summer. So, and there is now a sort of growing sense of uh, concern and ill ease about, you know, these sort of remote Highland communities, mostly populated by elderly people, suddenly being sort of overrun with visitors from you know from covid infested down south I and mean, obviously i'm sort of paraphrasing here but I, I just want to make people aware that you know the highlands is an incredibly hospitable friendly place but there's just this edge to it now where if your if perception of bad behavior could be met quite you know quite badly and camper vans is one area that's been a real sort of bone of contention recently so people coming up and like emptying their camper van port a loos in like you know, car parks and I mean just stupid stuff like that so just it's just all about it's common sense and and respectful you know behavior you know and it's what I would expect from paragliders um, absolutely um the second thing is as I mentioned about access so some of the landowners are a bit more twitchy about access because of COVID. So again, it's just 
good re good practice to get in touch with the locals and also if you see someone looking at you funny just go and talk to them and explain what you're doing and you know i think most people are very cool if you go and talk to them um we have a good relationship with the uh, mountain rescue teams up here and they have they've got real covid related concerns because if they get called out and obviously they're all volunteers it's a massive ball ache under any circumstances but now with COVID, it's even more so because it's all got to be done socially distanced and masked up and PPE'd and there's a limitation number of people can get in the helicopter and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, again, just sort of trying not to have an accident, it's an obvious one, but sort of trying not to put yourself in a position where you ever have to call out a mountain rescue team would be, would be ideal. And finally, the, the sort of big one really for sort of day to day flying is retrieves. Like I wouldn't have thought twice about flying cross country until last year, because you just land next to a road and stick your thumb out and the third car that comes along is gonna stop for you. Well, that's not the case anymore. So, and I don't think it will be in 2021, you know, even with the vaccines and stuff in place. So, you know, you, you definitely need to consider your retrieves and, you know, whether or not that's trying to fly now in return or a triangle, or trying to fly towards a train station or a bus station, or you know, ring in a taxi or whatever. But or or obviously having a friend who can come and get you. That's that's the ideal one. And again, locals will do that. You know, on the whole. Um, but don't expect people to stop if you're hitchhiking because I don't think they're going to this year. So just a few thoughts, COVID-related sort of thoughts. Okay. So um, I think the questions are kind of. Uh, trickling out now, Warwick. Um, one of the things that I'd probably like to close with is to thank you profusely. I, I, th I can't imagine that that was easy um, to jump in and out when it was uh, when your your uh, internet was failing. But thank you, thank you ever so much, um, and um, for for some amazing videos and photos uh, and a thoroughly researched sure. topic. Um, it was really really entertaining. Um, a, just a gentle reminder um, that um, Warwick does have a YouTube channel. Um, it's well worth a visit. In fact, it's actually how I, I uh, ended up getting in touch with Warwick. Um, it was just uh, all the places that he and Seb were flying um, were the, the places that I ultimately wanted to fly. So, um, so I've been getting in touch. Um, please go and visit his website. Um, and have a look at his uh, his uh, holiday destinations. Um, I don't know if you want to close uh, with a little bit of detail on that, Warwick, just before we shoot off. Sorry, on on what? Um, you you were saying earlier on that you've got your YouTube channel and you you've got a small business that you you run as well. So yeah, just like um, to... I I just like to um. I just want to say thank you to you, Jock, and to and to everyone who's who's um, um, logged in. And thank you. That's really kind. Um, have a look at the show notes. There's lots of really good, interesting resources in there. Um, and yeah, please have a look at a Highland Fling, a, a 2022 spring guided cross country uh, trip led uh, guided by Kieran Campbell, um, Scotland's premier paragliding guide, and. Um, and staying in my home where you'll be very welcome. And um, and we are looking forward to welcoming probably five pilots and their partners. And I think we've probably got about space for about three pilots and their partners left. Okay. And, and, and my YouTube channel, yeah, have a look. Thanks very much. Thank you, Warwick. Unless anybody's got any questions, I'd like to close now, if that's okay. Okay, Warwick. That seems to be uh, that seems to be us. Um, from the administration side, a few people are asking. Um, I will get the recordings compressed and such like, um, but tidied up, um, and put the the notes that Warwick's alluding to, uh, and send them out to the various chat groups. Um, just uh, on the TV, HTC can say this. Um, we will be. Uh, welcoming Greg Hamilton uh, in for a chat um, for the Thames Valley guys. Um, 
We've got some excellent um, international speakers um, from New Zealand and Alaska coming in. And if you know of any hang glider pilots, I'm desperately wanting to get in touch with some of them as well. And uh, Welsh pilots and Irish pilots, I'm trying to find a few. So if anybody knows anybody who'd be keen to, uh, I know Warwick set the bar pretty high, but um, he's obviously got domestic duties to carry on with. So we'll, we'll leave him there. And uh, oh, look at this. Look. Just literally came out of heaven. <laughs> right. So um, I'll be posting out um, this this show and um, the details for the next ones. Okay, everyone, uh, I'll close there now. Thank you very much and good evening.